What's up, whole church family? I hope that you're having a great summer so far. Today, we are continuing our Upside Down Kingdom teaching series, and today, our worship pastor, Brian Hodges, is gonna be talking about the war that we all face every time we are faced with an obstacle in life. So often, when things don't go our way, we respond with anger and jealousy and resentment and entitlement, feeling sorry for ourselves, And sometimes we respond in such a way that people don't even want to be around us. What happens if that gets flipped upside down? If something doesn't go our way, what happens if we actually responded with love and grace and gratitude and humility? And as crazy as it might sound, what if we worshiped? What would people might think, right? Pastor Brian is going to walk us through some instances in the book of Acts where people chose to do the opposite of what most of us would have done. He's excited to share with you a personal journey that he's been on over this last year and how God's been flipping his perspective upside down, right, and made a huge impact on his personal life and ministry. So let's just get ready today for what God has in store for us today through this message through Pastor Brian Hodges. How are we feeling this morning? You doing all right? Everybody good? I want to welcome uh, you guys here to Hope Church. I want to welcome you guys online. If you're watching online, thank you for tuning in with us. You guys over in Mevin today. I just want to open us up in prayer today. Can I do that? I know we've already prayed one time, but I don't think you can pray too much, right? Can we just pray real quick? God, we thank you so much, God, for this opportunity that we get. God, to spend time in your word. God, to spend time chasing after God what what it is you're trying to speak to us this morning. God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit, God, fill this room. God, fill this space. God, continue to work in this room. God, continue to work in our hearts, God, as we open our hearts, God, and our minds. God, to what you would have for us today. In your name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 So I do have a question. I want to start with a question today. Listen, and it's not rhetorical. So I do want to see some hands in the room. I do want to see some hand emojis online and over in Meb. And I'm going to get a report tomorrow if you guys are watching and paying attention today. So I do want to ask a question. And I can already answer this question for most of us, but I'm still going to ask it anyway. And I still want you guys to respond. Can we do that? So the question is this, how many of us have ever had to endure something that almost broke us, that almost broke us, that we didn't think that we would make it through, right? It could be emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, but something that we didn't think that we would make it through. And so I remember a couple years ago, we went on a staff retreat um, here at Hope Church, and we took our staff to Lynchburg, Virginia, And uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I hear the word retreat, all I really hear is the word treat, right? So I'm a snacker. How many snackers do we have in the room? Do we like, do we like snacks? We like snacks. So we get there about five o'clock PM and I'm unpacking all of my stuff and I have my, my Oreos and my Doritos and my Cheetos and my Ho-Hos and all the O's, all the things that, that 30 year old men should be eating, right? So I've got all those things, and I'm unpacking them, kind of stashing them away because I don't want anybody to see my snacks, right? So as soon as I unpack my snacks, I walk back out into the living room, and there stands our fearless leader, Tad Grandstaff, and he's in full workout attire. <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen guys, I don't know if you've seen Tad when he's got his workout clothes on, but he looks good, right? He spends some money on some workout clothes because he likes to look good at the gym. So I walk out. <laughs> And Tad said, Brian, go get some shorts and some shoes on. We're going on a run. (laughs) To which I immediately replied, no, I'm not. (laughs) Well, about that time, Pastor Doug and Pastor Alex walk into the room. They've got their workout clothes on. They don't look nearly as good as Pastor Tad, but they're ready. (laughs) They're ready to go on a run. And somehow I missed something. I thought we were there to to kind of relax and have a relaxing weekend. And I thought we were there to kind of spend some time with God and come back rejuvenated and feeling good and optimistic about life. My weekend wasn't planning, it wasn't panning out that way for me. So I couldn't be the only one in the house that didn't go. So I went back to my room, got my shorts and my shoes and I came back out. (sighs) All right, let's go. I can't be the only one. So we head out the door. But what I didn't mention though, is that our house was literally on top of a mountain. Not literally on top. It was, a, it was a neighborhood on the side of the mountain. But our house was at the top. So we take off. I get about a quarter mile into this run, and I'm feeling good. I hadn't ran in like 10 years. But I'm feeling good about it. 
We get about a half a mile in. I'm feeling pretty optimistic. I got this. I got it under control, right? We get about a mile in. I'm getting tired, but I'm not there yet. We get about a mile and a half into this run, and pastor says, all right, boys, it's time to turn around. So there's like a median in the middle of the road. You know what I'm talking about? Those concrete things that people sometimes plant trees and stuff in. So this is how you run when you're tired, right? I'm done. We turn around. We come around the median. Ah, crap. (laughs) We've been running downhill the whole time. No wonder I was feeling so good. I didn't make it 20 steps back up the mountain and I was done. I was finished. I said, I can't do this. It's funny and it's comical, but doesn't that sound a lot like life sometimes? Right? Like when we're running downhill, there's little to no resistance. We're feeling optimistic and we're feeling excited about life. But when a little bit of resistance comes, right? We start feeling timid and doubtful, scared. You guys know what I'm talking about? See, what I've learned in life That's what old people say. I'm not old yet. But what I've learned in life, though, is that Satan's tricks don't work the same at the top of the mountain as they do at the bottom. Like when you're at the top of the mountain and you're feeling good, you're feeling optimistic, you still have some energy. He can can try to chime in, right? But he's just chatter in the background, right? But when you're at the bottom and you're tired and you're exhausted, you have nothing left to give, man, that's when he lays it on thick, right? Right? See, what's hard about this, though, is I know that that Satan, as he attacks you and as he plays tricks on you, that our minds sometimes, we we don't know how to to defend ourselves, right? We don't know how to, to fight it off because when we're tired, we don't have that defense mechanism engaged, right? What I do know, though, is if I would have run a quarter mile down the mountain and I would have turned around and run back up, then I would have I would have felt great about myself. Got a little half mile run in, I'd have been feeling really, really good. But by the time I got to the bottom, I was so tired, I was so exhausted that I never believed I would make it back up. See, the mountain was so big, but my belief was so, so small. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down with us. It says, what I believe to be true will be true for me. What I believe to be true will be true for me. And you say, good job, Captain Obvious. I understand that, right? But I want you to let that sink in for a second, okay? What I believe to be true will be true for me. See, what I know to be true for myself is that there's been moments that I force myself to really question what I believe. Some people are scared to do that. But I force myself to ask questions like, do I really believe that God can heal people? Do I really believe that God has forgiven me? Do I really believe that my past is wiped away? Do I really believe that God is bigger than any mountain that I'm standing in front of right now? And I force myself to ask these questions because it's so easy to just say, I believe, right? I believe. I believe. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe that God will get me through it. But what I've learned When you're standing at the bottom of the mountain looking up, your perspective in that moment and what you believe in that moment will be true for you in that moment. So if you never believe you'll make it back up, then chances are you won't make it back up. And listen, this is not some kind of self-help, prosperity, gospel, anything like that. But I do believe that the same things apply when we consider our belief about God. A.W. Tozer wrote this. He said that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes in our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He goes on to talk about religion and how people will never um, rise above their religion and how religions will never rise above their belief and their ideas of God. I chewed on this all week and I'm I'm a simple-minded person. So I called a bunch of people who are smarter than me to talk to them about this. And this is a conclusion that we came up with this week is that our understanding of God determines the box that we put God in. Does that make sense? Our understanding of God determines the box that we put him in. 
But the more we pursue God, the more we chase after God, the more we read God's word, the more we pray to God, the more we spend intentional quiet time with God, the more we understand God. The more we understand God, the more we believe. And the more we believe, then we begin to see the evidence of God in our life because he's always working. He's always moving. Sometimes you have blinders on, right? When we begin to believe, we begin to see that God is moving in every, every single detail of our life. And so you stop saying things like, I wish God would heal this person. You start declaring things like, I know God can. If he's willing, I know he can. You stop thinking coincidence and you start believing divine intervention, right? You stop walking with this limp of fear in life. You start walking with this swagger of faith, right? I can't walk with a swagger anymore. I used to a long time ago. Different kind of swagger. But I don't do that too much these days. But I'm telling you, though, for real, this is, this is the number one thing that I've had conversations with people about as a pastor. People come to me and, and they're like, Brian, how do I connect my heart and my head? Like, how do I connect the two when it comes to what I believe about God? And sadly, I've come to this conclusion is that your heart will only believe to the extent that your mind will allow it to. When you put God in a box, your heart will only believe as much as your mind says it can. So I want to ask you this question today, and I'm going to give you just a second to think about it. What comes into your mind when you think about God? What's the first thing that comes into your mind when you think about God? It's kind of hard to answer, isn't it? Does it depend on your circumstance, whatever situation you're in? Because let me tell you, God never changes. But you know what does change? Your circumstances change. Your beliefs sometimes change, right? And let me tell you what I, what I believe about God. Is that God will give you strength because he never runs out of strength. That he never fails. He never gives up. He never throws in the towel. He never leaves you alone. He never abandons you. He's the sustainer of the universe and everything in it, right? We believe these things about God. And I can promise you that whatever you're dealing with today, that God is bigger than that and he ain't scared, right? So I want you to cling on to that like in your weakest moment when you're standing at the bottom of that mountain. I want you to cling on to that because God is not scared. I want you to see what it says right here in Isaiah chapter 40. It says, have you ever, have you never heard, have you never understood the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. It said he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. You ever feel weak? You ever feel tired? Anybody ever feel tired? Yes. I feel pretty tired right now. I only slept like three hours last night. Say this, but God, but God, I stole this from Pastor Tad, but God gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. They soar high on wings like eagles and they will not grow weary. That doesn't sound like weakness to me, does it? Sounds like the opposite of weak to me. And that's what this teaching series has been all about is the opposite way of thinking, the upside down kingdom, God's way of looking at things. See, the world says you're strong. You're strong. You're the strongest person I know. You can get through this, right? You can get through this. No problem. You're so strong. They say that relying on somebody else is for the weak, right? Listen, there's nothing wrong with being strong, but don't believe the lie that the enemy tries to whisper in your ear when he tells you all those things that I just said, that you're so strong, you're so powerful, you can get through it. 
Don't believe that because he's trying to get you to forget what it says in verse 31 where it says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength because he doesn't want you to find new strength. He wants you to rely on your old tired strength. He don't want you to find new strength because as long as you rely on your old strength, he has a stronghold on you. Whoo! See, I believe it's the most important part of this scripture because it teaches you how to be strong. And let me tell you, it's not by just enduring It's not by just getting by, just limping along life. It's by facing your enemies head on and telling them that you're not laying down for anybody because the God of the universe is fighting for you. And even in your weakest moment, even at the bottom of the mountain, you still have God fighting for you in your corner. Gives you boldness in a battle, right? Write this down with us today. It says, the true strength begins... When we admit that we are weak. Psalm 73, 26 says this. It says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is, the, is my strength, the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You know, one of my favorite songs is a song called Give Me Faith. It was written by Elevation Worship like a million years ago, I feel like. But I still remember the first time I ever heard that song. And the song starts with this bridge. It says, I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. And my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. That gripped me so hard. It's still one of my favorite songs to this day. It's, I may be weak. I am weak. But God, your Holy Spirit is strong. God, and you live inside of me. So that makes me strong, Right? See, when we admit that we're weak, it doesn't belittle us. It exalts God. It doesn't make us smaller. It just puts into perspective how big God is when we admit that we're weak. It's choosing to acknowledge the majesty and the power of God when we admit that we're weak. And listen, I know things don't always go our way. But does that mean that God is any less in control when things don't go our way? Because it's not how we want it to go. So God's not in control now. Is that really what we think? But we do trick ourselves into start believing that, don't we? See, what happens in the moments when we feel like we're losing control? What happens in those moments when we decide to just release all control over to God. Just give all of it over to God. God, I trust you to take over. God, even one step further, I'm going to worship you in this moment. I'm going to fall down at your feet, and I'm going to trust you. It's hard to do, right? Because a lot of times when we're in those moments, when we're in the bottom of the mountains, and when things aren't going our way, we tend to blame God. We're mad at God because we feel like it's his fault that it happened to us, right? See, worship looks different for everybody, and I don't want you to trick yourself into thinking that you need a band and a worship leader and a song and a melody to worship God, because it's not true. Sometimes it's just doing exactly what I just said, fall at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Worship is adoration towards God. It's adoration towards Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I know this is hard right now. But you've got this under control, and I trust you with every moment of my life. It's fixing your thoughts on Jesus. That's what it's really after. That's what worship is all about. And I know that's hard, especially when things aren't really going your way, right? So when Tad asked me to to come and speak today, I knew exactly what I was going to talk about. Because I've been doing a study on Paul and Paul's ministry. And I had just read a scripture where Paul... And Silas were preaching in the name of Jesus. They were telling everybody about this man, Jesus, who who died and rose again. He was the son of God. And people didn't like that he was saying that stuff. So they arrested Paul and Silas, and they threw him in prison after beating him half to death. And they threw him in jail. And jail is not the air-conditioned building downtown where you can earn TV times and you get three meals a day. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, they beat them within an inch of their life. 
and they threw him in this deep, dark dungeon of a cell with rats and roaches, cold, wet, left them there. And I want you to see how Paul and Silas responded, and you already know what they did. I want you to see how they responded, and then I want you to think, is this how I would have responded in this situation? Look what it says right here. We'll pick up our story in verse 25. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. For real? That's what they decided to do in that moment. And all the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakened from his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing all the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the surprising part of this story is that all of us, most of us, if not all of us, would have been sitting in that dungeon, crying and complaining and upset and mad at God because we did something that he asked us to do and it didn't work out. Am I right? How many of us would have been upset about that situation? Let's just be honest. So I started out by asking you guys, how many of us have ever been in a situation that almost broke us? But in light of what we just read, I want to ask you a new question. How many of us believe that there's nothing that God can't do? There's nothing that God can't do. There's no mountain that's too big for God. See, we all agree that God is more than enough to handle our situation. So what's the problem? Like, why are we still crippled by fear? Why do we let fear and anxiety well up in our hearts? Because we already know the answer. Listen, I'm preaching to myself today, but I'm going to give you all the answer to this. Is that cool? I'm going to give you all the answer. It's this, because too often our circumstances overshadow our purpose. And our purpose on earth is to worship God. We lose that perspective. Our circumstances overshadow that perspective. We're supposed to be in line with God. We're supposed to be in tune with God. We're supposed to have this connection with God. And when our circumstances change and things go south, we lose all focus. We start looking down. We start thinking we can control things, right? See, when Paul and Silas were beaten and they were thrown into prison, they saw the mountain in front of them. But they reminded themselves in that moment of all that Jesus had gone through. And how dare they complain? How dare they start feeling sorry for themselves? See, they counted it an honor to be persecuted in the name of Jesus. And that sounds crazy. But they counted it an honor. They remember what it said in Hebrews 12 when it says, Think of all the hostility that Jesus endured from sinful people. Hostility from people like you and I. And then you won't become weary and give up. See, they could see the mountain in front of them, but yes, it pretty much sucked. It was not a good situation. But when they considered all that Jesus had gone through, when they were reminded of Jesus, that he was beaten and crucified, they were filled with gratitude. They were filled with gratitude and they had no other response but to worship. Write this down if you're taking notes today. Is that gratitude is the heart of worship. See, God has given us everything. Everything that we have. The breath that's in our lungs. The breath that you're breathing right now, God gave that to you. We lose perspective sometimes. See, Jesus, Jesus was beaten. He was spit on. He was mocked. He was laughed at. He was nailed to a cross. He 
He hung there, and just before he took his last breath, he said, God, forgive all of these people. Forgive all of them who have done this to me. He took his last breath. They took a spear and stuck it in his side just to make sure he was dead. They took him to a tomb, put him in a cold, dark tomb, rolled the stone in front of the tomb and walked away. And come on, guys, you guys know the story, right? We believe and we know the story because what happened next? He didn't stay there, did he? He didn't stay there, did he? Hey, he didn't stay there, did he? Come on, somebody. He rose from the tomb. He walked out of that place. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of our Father in heaven. And when we consider all of that, all of what he did, the plan that was started from the beginning that he willingly walked into, who walks into that? Who says, I know the end, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm not signing up for that. When you consider all of that, I don't know about you guys, but I'm grateful. Are you grateful? So I'm grateful for life. And I'm grateful for new life in Jesus. I'm grateful for his mercy, for his grace, for his forgiveness, for all the things that I don't deserve that he gives me anyway. And I'm even grateful, as crazy as it might sound, for the difficult circumstances. Because I know they will bring me closer to my father if I choose to believe in the nature of God. And it's God's nature to love and protect his children. And I have to believe that even when things aren't going my way. I have to believe that God loves me and that my best interest is in his mind. And I have to let it go. That's all you can do. So we close today. I just want to spend some time just reflecting for all of us. And we're going we're gonna to worship together. We're going to sing another song together. I, I couldn't come out here and speak without bringing my guitar with me, right? We're going to sing a song together in a minute. But before we do that, I want us to just spend some time together in your own head, in your own voice, in your own words. We're going to spend time together today just telling God how grateful we are. How grateful we are for the things that we don't deserve. How grateful we are for Jesus. How grateful we are that we don't have to live in our past. That we don't have to drag that junk around with us. Because Jesus made a way for us to leave it all behind. And he made a way for us to see heaven and chase after that. Because that's what we're chasing after. I don't know about you guys. I don't want to live back there. I want to move forward. I want to chase after what God has, right? So as we close today, I, I really just, I want us to all close our eyes together. Everybody close our eyes and just spend time in your own words, in your own mind, in your own heart, just thanking God. Just thanking God for all that he's done. For all that he continues to do. Just tell him how grateful you are this morning. I'm gonna give you some time Just spend some time with God in this moment.
we have to offer to you is so small, God, in comparison to what you've given us. God, today we just want to respond in gratitude, God. We just want to sing to you. God, we're going to sing loud to you, God, because we want to represent, God, our joy-filled hearts. God, we love you so much. God, thank you for all that you've done, God, all that you've given us. God, thank you for the moments, God, that are hard. God, I thank you for picking up the pieces, God. God, for never leaving us alone, God, for never forsaking us. We love you so much. stepping into you, God. We're pressing into you. Set for a heart singing hallelujah. 
throw up my hands one more time with all we've got. Let's sing it out. Come on. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. Thank you so much. God, we thank you for these moments, God, in life. God, you bring us to a crossroad, God, and we have to choose if we believe. God, help us today, God, to be in our unbelief, God. God, to fill our unbelief, God. God, with your Holy Spirit. God, so that we don't have those moments, God, where we're standing at the bottom of the mountain, God, and we feel like we're all alone. God, we have those moments, God, where we feel like we're relying on our own strength, God. God, help us to press into you. God, to love you more. God, to pursue you more. God, to chase after you more. We love you so much, God. We're so grateful for you. In your name we pray. Amen. However or wherever you're watching or listening, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Alex and I'm the online pastor here at Hope Church. And here at Hope, we want to do whatever it takes for all people to follow, grow, and live for Jesus. And so our prayer for you here today is that you would not only feel encouraged and inspired through today's message, but that we could also help you take your next step towards Jesus today. So if today you're feeling empowered to take your next step, I wanna invite you to do one of two things. The first is to go to our website, hopechurchnc.com, and go to the Next Steps tab to sign up for Next Steps. This is a great way, whether you're in person or online, to get connected to Hope Church. And secondly, if you have a specific prayer request, a praise, or a question, you can email me at alex at hopechurchnc.com. I'd love to personally connect with you. And as always, if you would say that Hope Church is making an impact in your life and encouraging you in your relationship with Jesus, then I'd like to invite you to support this ministry through generosity. Week after week, we're seeing lives change because of Jesus. So we would be honored for you to partner with us as we continue to do whatever it takes for all people to follow, grow, and to live for Jesus. You can also download the Hope Church app in the App Store or Google Play Store for more resources and to stay up to date with everything that's going on here at Hope Church. We want to do anything that we can and everything that we can to help and resource you in your relationship with Jesus. Again, thank you so much for watching or listening. We hope to hear from you soon.